What happens when a podiatrist who is not learning anything necessarily about natural movement or barefoot running or minimal shoes reads Born to Run, the evil book that started this all? So we're going to find out on today's episode of The Movement Movement, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body starting with those things at the end of your legs. I think we call them feet. Um, It's also where we break down the propaganda, the mythology and the outright lies you've probably been told about what it takes to run or walk or hike or do yoga or CrossFit or powerlift or skydive or whatever you'd like to do. And to do that enjoyably and efficiently and effectively. And did I mention enjoyably? Trick question. If you've been here before, you know, I know I said that because look, if you're not having fun, do something different till you are, because you're not going to keep it up if it's not really enjoyable. So I'm Stephen Sashin, CEO and co-founder of ZeroShoes.com. And I'm the host of this podcast. We call it the Movement Movement because we are creating a movement, more about that in a second, about natural movement, letting your body do what it's made to do. And the movement part is simple. Go to our website, www.jointhemovementmovement.com. You don't need to do anything to join. There's no secret handshake. There's no membership fees. You don't even have to opt in if you don't want to, but that's where you'll find previous episodes. You can opt in to find out about the new episodes. You can find all the places you can find the podcast and all the things you can do to encourage the movement of natural movement, which is share and like and review and give a thumbs up in the places you can do that and hit the bell icon on YouTube and you know what to do. I mean, basically, if you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe. So let us jump in. Alyssa, do me a favor. Tell the people who you are and what you're doing here. Hi. So, yep, I am a podiatrist. um, And basically, I'm here because, you know, I have really changed the way that I practice. And I'm really excited to come on here and just talk about, you know, sort of the barefoot movement and natural movement as it, you know, sort of relates to podiatry and how it's kind of evolved my practice. Well, so I started this by saying, you know, hey, someone who didn't necessarily learn about this then read Born to Run. So um, do you want to talk about what they were or weren't teaching you in podiatry school? And then how did you even decide to read that book and what happened when you did? Yeah. So I actually decided to read it because I had friends from college who were really into running and they were like, this is an amazing book. You should read it. So it really had nothing to do with podiatry. Um, I was reading it like during a summer break, I think during my first year of school. So it was completely unrelated to academics. Um, and so, yeah, I read it and I loved it. And I was like, this is just a really cool, cool idea. And so I remember coming back to school in the fall and actually asking some of my professors about it. And I basically just got the, <laughs> the kind of typical podiatry response, which was like, you know, barefoot shoes are the worst thing that's ever happened to podiatry and and to feed and nobody should ever wear them. And, you know, all we see are stress fractures now. And, you know, this is awful and horrible. And it kind of shut it down, basically (laughs) shut down the conversation. Well, so I want to, I want to pick some of that apart. So why were they thinking, I mean, it's somewhat ironic actually to say it's the worst thing that could happen to podiatry if they're suddenly getting more patients. Right. (laughs) But I'm intrigued by that. I mean, I only half joke Then in the early days when in 2009, 2010, when the running shoe companies were terrified, they were literally never going to sell another running shoe because everyone was going to go barefoot. They were putting out articles that may as well have said, if you run barefoot, you're going to step on hypodermic needles. You're going to catch Ebola. Your kids won't get into college. Your phone will stop working. Your mortgage rate will go up. Your car will run out of gas. I mean, it was just getting crazy. So was there any more that they said to justify why they believe these things? No, not really. <laughs> there wasn't a whole wow. lot of justification. And, and you know, at the time I was I was a bit naive because I was kind of in the early stages of podiatry school. It was a lot of um just kind of didactics. We weren't really learning about feet yet. So I didn't really have a, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of information to really go by. So I kind of just trusted my professors and I was like, oh, okay, you know, you know, maybe this is really bad and and maybe they don't really know what they're talking about. So, you know, it kind of just made me almost like stop asking the questions. I was kind of like, all right, you know, let me see what I learned in the, in the next couple of years and maybe make my own decisions about it. All right. So you had this like, oh my gosh, I got to share this. You shared it. They shut it down. And what happened next is clearly it didn't stop there. Yeah. I mean, you know, I would say that the, the interesting thing about podiatry school is that they there really isn't a lot of education around shoes at all. Um, we actually had one lecture <laughs> in my entire four years oh, um, no. about shoes, which is really scary. <laughs> um, I can remember it really clearly. We actually had, you know, we had a lecture and we had like one slide and it was like a picture of like an old timey dress shoe. And like the professor had kind of like labeled the parts of the shoe. And like, that was pretty much it. Like we really didn't learn anything else about shoes. Oh, so really? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bizarre. <laughs> It's funny. I had a friend who was going through physical therapy school and when they started getting to feet, she was calling me saying, did you know, like the guy who made up the idea of orthotics, like made it up? 
I said, yeah, yeah I did know that. He goes, why don't people know this? I went, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> exactly. <But> I mean, <laughs> so they, they weren't teaching about shoes. At some point, I assume somewhere in there, um, somebody came in with the idea about orthotics and how to use orthotics in some way. And they, yeah. I'm guessing they spent way more time on that. Exactly. Yeah. That was really where the emphasis was. So I think it kind of just translated into, well, you know, orthotics are really where it's at. So any shoe you recommend is just whatever you can really get an orthotic into. And that was kind of like the way, the way people operated. <laughs> and they, they never suggested that uh, the different kind of shoes and how shoes would wear out over time would change the effectiveness of an orthotic if it's effective at all. Honestly, no, you know, I don't recall anybody ever talking about that, which is really <laughs> just crazy. And I remember getting out into practice and just being like, I don't even really know, you know, I don't really know what to recommend. And, and I remember just thinking like, yeah, just go to the shoe store, right? Like, you know, just go, go see a shoe specialist. Cause I don't, I don't actually know this information, which is really scary. All right. So going through the chronology of this again, all right. Uh, read the book. <laughs> Oh my gosh, shut it down. Nothing about shoes, a bunch about orthotics. And again, like I'm, I'm just so fascinated because l- let me preface it this way. You know, it's a rare person who is willing to question what they believe. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so uh, this is why I'm so curious to see, you know, again, what the next step was for you and how that continued to evolve. Yeah. So from like a personal standpoint, I was always kind of, I kind of gravitated towards not like barefoot shoes technically, but more minimalist shoes. I, I always kind of liked that feeling. So I how are more you like, defi- how are you defining the difference? So, you know, I would say at the time, like this would be back in like, you know, 2012 timeframe. So I wore like Nike free runs and like, not that those are minimalist, but for, compared to other shoes out there, they, they felt kind of good to me. Right. Well, like, you know, I mean, I like just, this. yeah. And, and to give them some, some credit, but not very much. Um, when I put on the <laughs> Nike free, it was amazing because with the articulated sole, you felt the ground more, yep. but still, you know, massive elevated heel, tons of cushioning, yeah. fair sole, pointy toes, the whole thing. But at the time it was somewhat revelatory. Yeah. And the early, of course, they made that shoe inspired by the Stanford running team who uh, who trained barefoot. And the idea was, let's make something that's akin to barefoot and it's nothing like it. So <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I, all right, so that, but, and, but that back in uh, 2012, okay, I have to figure out what date is. Um, so you went for Nike free. There was mm-hmm. stuff out there. We hadn't yeah. made shoes yet, but there were a couple brands that had at that time. Yeah. And I, I really wasn't even like, aware or I, I didn't really know at the time. I was just kind of like, oh, you know, this this feels good, right? If I'm going to go to a regular store and get a shoe, I, I would typically gravitate towards just sort of more minimalist, I, I would yeah. say. And so I kind of stuck with that, you know, even like my regular everyday shoes, I would go with like maybe like Tom's, like flat shoes. Like I just liked stuff like that. And I never saw a problem with it. And then as I went throughout my, throughout school and throughout my career, I started to get more and more kind of like feedback from people being like, you know, oh, those shoes are, you know, horrible. You shouldn't wear, <laughs> you should never wear flat shoes like that. You know, all this kind of stuff. And nobody ever had a reason. Nobody ever had like a, <laughs> any explanation as to why. I think, you know, it really just seems like it's, it's like a very ingrained dogma, I think, within podiatry that, you know, whatever this supportive shoe is that, that people talk about, it's really just people tell you over and over again, right? You need support, you need support, you need support. So kind of got drilled into my head and, and eventually... I was like, yeah, I need support. Like, you know, I I should stop wearing all these like, you know, flimsy shoes and and get some support on me. So I sort of started to go in the other direction because I had heard this just for so long. Um, And that's when I started to kind of run into trouble with my own feet. (laughs) Uh Aha. So, So, yeah. I mean, what did you switch to and then what happened? Yeah. So probably like two years into private practice, I was like, okay, you know what? I should be a good example for my patients. Right. And I should probably get, you know, one of these expensive shoes and, you know, something that's really supportive and and awesome. So, you know, I ended up getting like a Brooks ghost and you know, they felt okay. I was like, yeah, they're they're comfortable. Right. Uh, Whatever. Um, (laughs) I've got to interrupt. The irony just hit me. Um, It's called the ghost because they kill your feet. Exactly. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be here all week. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, no, it was so funny. I mean, like everybody in my office would just wear like, you know, either Brooks or Asics or a New Balance. Those were kind of like the, the top three. And so I kind of started trending towards that. I was like, all right, this is really good. I should wear, you know, arch support. And then it probably was like a year later that I started to really get a pain in my left foot. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm starting to get Halix Limitus <laughs> all of a sudden. And it was really frustrating. I was like, man, you know, I'm kind of like doing all the, all the things and I'm wearing these supportive shoes. And like, you know, I, I really never wanted to wear orthotics. And so I was like, I'm not going to wear orthotics. Like, even though I I prescribe them to patients, I just really never wanted to go that route for myself. So it kind of reached a tipping point where I did a ton of hiking one summer and all of a sudden it got really aggravated. (laughs) And I was like, oh no, (laughs) what am I going to do now? 
And that was like literally the impetus that made me kind of like, it's like a light bulb went off. And I, I realized like, I really had to actually do some actual research and like figure out what the heck was going on. And like, why was I even recommending these shoes to people? I really didn't know. I had just been told so many times and I started to realize that it wasn't actually helping my feet. So, you know, maybe it wasn't helping my patients. So when you started doing the research, what'd you bump into? Who'd, who'd you find? Who'd you read? What'd you discover? <sighs> Yeah. So I, I was really resistant at first, which I think is, is funny because now I'm like, wow, I can't believe that I went this long. Um, and so I actually started just kind of looking around, even just on social media, I started seeing like different accounts and people were talking about this stuff. And honestly, I was like, no, this doesn't make any sense. You know, <laughs> it can't be true. <laughs> so it took me a while. I think, that, I think that's a, that's a great bit of cognitive dissonance. I want to see what the research <laughs> is, but then I see it. No, that can't be right. Exactly. This, which this is actually, like, this is what wow. you <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. even again, I'm so intrigued and I, I love that you're able to walk through this frame by frame, but it's like, even when you get the idea to do it, the natural inclination is to look at the information and just reject it and stick with what you believe even harder usually is what the totally. research is. Yeah, I, it, absolutely. I was like looking at these accounts and I was like, oh no, these people are like, you know, this is so wrong. But eventually it just, it kind of kept hitting me and I was like, I need to, I really need to figure this out. So I did start researching. I actually found um, Emily Splickle and she had a, has a lot of great information and I I reached out to her and, and started to read, you know, research and um, footwear science has a lot of really good articles. And I started looking at into that. I looked at some of the research from Ben O'Nig and different people. And I was like, wow, this is a whole other perspective that I just had no idea, like no clue. And eventually I was like, oh, this is really cool. You know, like this is, <laughs> this is really cool stuff. And so it just kind of snowballed. And then I started to really get into everything that I could get my hands on. And, and finally, I decided to try, you know, try some minimal shoes myself and kind of go through that transition process. And then the rest was really history. Well, okay. Yeah. We can't do the rest is history because there's a bunch of steps there. <laughs> um, you, you got something truly minimalist, um, put it on and what happened? Yeah. So I was a little bit careful because I was like, you know what, you know, I don't want to jump into it too quickly. So I ended up going, you know, kind of mid, mid road. I went with like an ultra, like a, a low level ultra, which, um, you know, it, it still has a decent cushion, but at least you're getting that nice, um, you know, barefoot kind of shape and everything. Um, and I, I mean, I loved it. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> and so I basically, you know, kind of put myself through like a little transition period where I started just going barefoot as much as possible. I would like start doing like little foot exercises around the house. I was like building up my foot strength, um, just kind of walk on different surfaces. I was like doing everything that I could. And then meanwhile, using the ultras for like long walks and like things like that. So I wouldn't, you know, go too quickly. And then basically once I felt comfortable with that, I think it took a couple months before I really was like, okay, I'm ready to, you know, kind of dive into to barefoot shoes. And once I did, I was like, okay, there's really no, no going back from here. It just, it felt really good. And at the same time, I mean, it did take some time and it did take a little bit of specific rehab as well, but I really, I was able to completely get rid of my foot pain <laughs> that I was having, which was really cool for me to see because I had never really had that perspective for myself. What was the difference? I mean, the guys at Ultra are good friends of mine, so I'm not throwing them under the bus when I ask this, but it could look yeah. like I'm throwing them under the bus when I ask this. In fact, they used to say, you know, we think Ultra is the gateway to something like Zero Shoes. And I said, why don't you put some ads for us in your boxes? Um, which right. amazingly, <laughs> they did not agree with you. But what do you feel was the difference when you went from an ultra to something truly minimalist? It definitely felt like almost like I had a little bit more control, right? Like I was like, okay, I'm not, I'm no longer relying on this kind of cushioning. And now I can really feel for me, it was really feeling my own gait cycle, right? Like I was like, I can feel what I'm doing now, which I know before, like, I just could not, I could not tell. And so during that kind of ultra transition period, I was really trying to retrain my gait cycle and really focusing on, you know, getting, <laughs> getting through correctly. And when I got into an actual barefoot shoe, I can really do that. And now it's just like, it comes very naturally now, whereas before I I wouldn't really know where I was in space. I wouldn't really know like what was going on. So that's really been a huge, huge difference for me. And how would you describe the differences in your gait, you know, sort of before, during, after? Yeah, I think before, like everything was kind of wonky. Um, and of course I was coming off of like- <laughs> Wait, Hold on, is that a medical course. term? Wait, I had to look, had to look that up. And, it's very, okay. yeah, it's very technical. <laughs> but, you know, I kind of felt like my feet were almost like all over the place, right? Like I really wasn't propulsing properly through my like, toe joints. And like, I just really couldn't tell where my feet were. And so now, you know, as I'm walking, I can feel, right? That I'm going into that like nice hiker push-off and going right through my big toe. And for me, that was important because I wanted to make sure like I'm really getting 
getting, you know, big toe extension and everything. So I'm not jamming my toe. And, you know, I was envisioning my future of like needing a, a big toe fusion. And I'm like, this is horrible. I can't, I can't have that happen. So now every time I walk, I'm really just cognizant of it. Um, and so, yeah, I can, I can feel my pattern and I can feel that it's much better. I also noticed that, you know, as soon as I got out of the cushioning, I was like, really like, wow, I'm very like aware of my glutes now. And I'm aware of like these other muscles that I really just never felt or never thought of while I was walking, um, which is very cool. It, it's my favorite thing. Um, I mean, it, my wife has this great story where after I made her the first pair of sandals back in 2009, um, she, she was like, yeah, okay. And then put them on and wore, wore them for a couple of weeks. And then the first thing she noticed was how she was slamming her heels into the ground and walking yeah. really hard. Like she was a high powered Chicago attorney late for court when we're heading down to the <laughs> farmer's market in Boulder. And then after a couple of weeks, she put on like a regular quote unquote sports sandal, a healthy quote unquote sports sandal. And her immediate thing was, I can't feel anything when yeah. you that. That's not okay. And just toss them away. So that transition is a big thing. But now, you know, you're in the more interesting position. And I should have brought this up earlier because even deciding to research this, you are at a certain level um, risking your professional persona, if you will. And this yeah. is why I see, you know, most people aren't, most people who are um, healthcare professionals aren't willing to look at it because if they've been recommending something for years to then suddenly say to their patients, and I'm going to ask you what you said to your patients, uh, you know, that alone would stop them from making any sort of changes. So, so you made, you made this shift for yourself. How did that then translate into your practice? And what was your, what was the response from your patients? Yeah. So I was definitely really nervous um, just in general, because it is really, it's a big shift to go through and everybody kind of looks at you funny <laughs> when you start to say things like this. Um, so it actually worked out pretty easily for me. So I was working in a, like a private private practice. So just doing very normal kind of podiatry stuff. Um, and that's when I was really starting this, but I actually ended up leaving that job and deciding like, you know, I, I can't really practice in this way anymore. Like now that I've kind of seen a little bit of this information, like it just clicked. And I was like, wow, I actually really need to completely change the way that I practice. And it's not going to work to have these like the little 10 minute visits with people and like, you know, kind of be rushing patients in and out and, you know, maybe send them home with a shoot list. Like that was kind of the best I could do before and, and really try to counsel them as, as much as I could. So I ended up completely shifting gears and leaving private practice and starting just a virtual practice so that I could at least be with people one-on-one -on -one and spend at least an hour with them and really talk them through things. So it ended up working out well because I didn't have to necessarily like go from, you know, regular podiatry stuff and then try to convince those people right. to then, you know, change. It was a little bit more, now I'm attracting people that are a little bit more open to this. So that, that was really helpful. Yeah. That's too bad. It would have been yeah. much more fun if you had amazing stories about people telling you you're completely full of shit. I know. Um, I know. <laughs> I kind of wish I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a fascinating thing. I don't know if, if it's like this in the podiatry world, but there's something I've seen in the physical therapy world where certain ideas show up and they seem goofy. And sometimes they are goofy. Sometimes they're like an infomercial product, like the shake weight of all things. And then five years later, every physical therapist has one and they're using it. Um, and yet at the same time, something like, I was actually at a um, physical therapist the other day and they had a copy of Born to Run on the shelf. And everybody in that physical therapy office was wearing some big, thick padded shoe. Oh my gosh. Like, did you, how, what'd you think of that book? Oh my God, I loved it. Did it make any difference for you? What do you mean? It's like, what exactly. the... So, you know, it, it was, that gap is fascinating to me. It really is. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. I mean, I, I can't even imagine now like going back and I, I feel the same. I, I see people that are still doing that. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what are you doing? You know, but, but I also know that it is really hard and just take that, that time to kind of conceptualize it and, and really take it in when you've been taught something else for so long. Given what you know now, if you um, had said to your professors, oh my gosh, you know, you got to check this out. And they gave you those answers that they had given you. How would you respond to them now? Yeah. I mean, now I would just, I would show them some research and be like, well, you know, what do you think about this? <laughs> oh, you're so naive. You think that showing them research would make a difference. That's so yeah. I mean, you know, not that it would, but I just think it's funny that, you know, I, I cannot think of a single example of anybody that's showed me any research to the contrary or been like, you know, Hey, this is why you should recommend this shoe. People would just say, you know, Oh, get a new balance. You know, these are really good. <laughs> like that's it. That's all people would ever say. So yeah, when I, when I, really um, when I've been on panel discussions, AKA debates with people who uh, other footwear companies who do, you know, quote, normal looking shoes. Um, I just ask them the same question over and over. I go, where's your proof? 
Yeah. And, and they just never have anything to rely on. And they give amazing excuses. They say, well, you know, having a study to prove that what we do improves performance or reduces injury would take a long time, be really expensive, have a lot of confounding factors. And I said to one of them, yeah, um, if you could make a shoe demonstrably better than the guy sitting next to you, it's worth billions of dollars a year. And you're telling me you're not doing it because it's difficult. Mm. Right, exactly. <laughs> then, but then, <laughs> of course, people sense. ask me, you know, why don't you do it? I go, well, because the study that I'm talking about would cost about $10 million. Right. And there's mm-hmm. no one in the minimalist world, the barefoot world, yeah. who has that kind of cash right now, um, exactly. hopefully in the not too distant future. But even then, you know, I wonder how much, if we had the perfect study, we took a thousand people, a third of them stay in their regular shoes, a third of them uh, switch to something minimalist, a third of them switch to something minimalist and get some instruction. And we track them over the course of a year or maybe 18 months. I, uh, I'm curious what you think. My position is if that study showed unequivocally that minimalist barefoot is better, people would still ignore it. Yeah, no, I think they would. And I think it's just, it's like you said earlier, it's like, it's so ingrained in your mind and you just can't, I think it's really hard to accept that. And and even seeing the research, it's like, oh, I still don't think so. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what, how people would respond to that, but. You know, well, it's like, there's an article on our website um, about orthotics and barefoot running. And it was inspired by a New York Times article uh, from a woman who has, I think my favorite name in the world, it's um, Gina Collada. And, um, and Gina is just a brilliant science writer. I totally love her work. And it, it couldn't have been more clear to say, and even Ben O'Nig chimed in and said, yeah, orthotics are really just for recovery and you should be doing foot strengthening along the way and then get out of them as quickly as possible. Yeah. And, that's, and, and there's no evidence that they're helpful. At the time, there wasn't the research showing that they actually make your feet weaker. Um, right. You know, yeah. Her Times article, and as far as I can tell, made no impact whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and, and this is the part that just amazes me. And I, uh, do you have any sense of what it would take for this, this somewhat paradoxical change of tides? And I say paradoxical because prior to 1972, 74, everything looked like what's on the wall behind me. Yeah, right. so, you know, these, these things that you're re- reporting as common, common knowledge was not common. Then it yeah. wasn't even knowledge. Then it was marketing. So, exactly. um, so, you know, but, but, to also to your point, we've been living with it for 50 years. So yeah. two generations by then it's quote, you know, what everyone believes. I don't know why I'm doing so many air quotes today. Anyway. <laughs> uh, but so do you have a yeah. sense of what it might actually take to change the current, change the tide? Yeah. I mean, I think that education is really important, especially in the schools. And I think that's where everything kind of starts. And so I, I really think it takes getting enough, you know, enough people, like let's say enough podiatrists or, you know, physical therapists or whoever to really start to understand this. And then, you know, if, if that information can get into a little bit of the education, you know, it would make a huge difference. Even if, even if students only had one lecture, you know, something, anything, cause like <laughs> we didn't have anything. Um, and we're supposed to, you know, kind of go off, go off that. So I think anything would be helpful that can kind of be in that sort of preliminary education, because I think, it's just very tough when you're trying to go against like, you know, you've had four years of school that have taught you differently. So even if you're just introduced to the idea as like, maybe this could work or maybe this could be okay versus, you know, this is awful and it's dangerous. I think that's kind of what we, we get, we get that it's too dangerous and nobody should do it. And as a practitioner, like you're putting yourself at risk for even recommending it. So it's just nuts. (laughs) I'm I'm so intrigued by the too dangerous thing because we've already got 50% 50% of runners, 80% of marathoners getting injured every year. So what exactly. are they comparing to? Exactly. Yeah, that's so true. And, and I would see it in my patients all the time, like where, you know, they're already in orthotics, they're already in right. supportive shoes, and they're still coming in with new injuries constantly. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense, right? They already have orthotics. In fact, they're supposed to be the treatment. So something's wrong here, you know, that's not adding up. I'm curious, and I'm not going to ask for a number, but I'm kind of asking for a number. Um, <laughs> how much... Let me, I'm going to ask it um, hypothetically. If some podiatrist with a traditional practice were to stop selling orthotics today, how much mm-hmm. money would they lose over the next year? Yeah. I mean, it's a huge part of the practice. Um, you know, it depends. It depends. I think everyone's a little bit different, but I think for most practices, it's one of the few things that you can consistently charge for, you know, high amounts of money for. And most, most states insurance doesn't cover a lot of it. So you're looking at, you know, out of pocket payments. So 
you know, I'm not sure about the exact number, but it would be a lot. It would definitely be a big chunk of the income. Um, and that, so that's a really big factor. I think it's going to be tough for people to wrap their mind around that and losing a big source of income and also kind of losing that idea that you're help, you know, you're really helping everybody by giving them these things. Well, that's actually another thing. I mean, if you're doing something where you're giving people a solution that actually helps them and gets them out of your practice, right? that's another thing. You've just lost yep. a couple of appointments. So, exactly. um, that's a fascinating thing. I mean, I think the education is one thing, but the mind, I mean, the mindset yeah. that has to go along with not just accumulating patients and upcharging them for various things. Yeah. Uh, boy, that's a high bar. Yeah. I think another big thing too, which is a huge barrier to the insurance, because when you're in practice <laughs> and you're battling insurance companies, you know, all they want to see is a diagnosis, right? They don't care, you know, what's causing the pain. They don't care what what's going on. They want to know the diagnosis and then they want to know what your treatment is. And so, you know, with a lot of these more natural movement kind of things, you know, you're not necessarily going to be giving someone an injection or, giving them a medication or giving them an orthotic, you're going to actually be well, teaching sure. them something. You can't yeah. bill for that. Well, you know, I think, I, I think you just gave me another answer to the, to my question of what, what do you think is going to change? And on the one hand, I like the answer. On the other hand, I know that this answer is fraught with peril. And my answer is we've got to start at the insurance level. Yeah. And the fraught with peril part has a couple of pieces. One is that we would need a body of research, which I would argue there already is, but yeah. we would need a body of research that would convince insurance companies that, uh, a, sorry, a body of research and a semi-reliable protocol uh, for people to follow. Yeah. Um, and, but the, the fraught with peril is I have friends who are selling, for example, um, balance programs for the elderly. These things demonstrably work. Dem I mean, insurance companies are already spending money on balance programs for the elderly because people falling down, breaking their hip and dying is really expensive, which it happened to my dad. And the most incredible expense was that when he died, he had no personal assets. And so the hospitals and the insurance companies and everyone just had to eat the cost of him being in the hospital for 10 days on the oh, way wow. to dying. But my friends who are developing demonstrably beneficial products and they're, they're going the insurance route, they've been doing this for years. And those ships turn so slowly that on the one hand, again, it would, could arguably be the solution. On the other hand, we're moving faster than they can, possibly can. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's very tough. I, I don't think a lot changes very quickly when it comes to insurance, but yeah, I mean, unfortunately that really does dictate what, what, you know, physicians or any practitioners can do. Um, and if you're in a traditional setting, it's, it's tough. I think it's very logistically difficult, even if you're starting to really embrace this. Yeah. Um, I just realized, as I said that, um, someone that I know, his family was in the insurance business. His father started an insurance company. His dad ran it for years, and unfortunately, he retired. And so I don't know. It, it would be interesting to talk to him uh, or to get through to his dad and say, how, how could we do this? And he, I'm sure he would just say, yeah, okay, good luck. <laughs> good luck. Absolutely. I'm, gonna have, I'm literally going to have to reach out and yeah. uh, that conversation. It never occurred to me. Um, yeah, no, it would be fascinating to, yeah, to hear. Well, because in my mind, you know, doing it in the court of public opinion is the is sort of the best thing to do. But, but I don't. These aren't mutually exclusive. Kind of a top down and bottom up approach is right. more likely to be valuable. I said I did a um, a pitch to some potential investors a little while ago, and I said, look, I'm going to tell you why almost everything you believe about footwear is wrong, and there's science behind everything I'm going to say. But you're probably still going to doubt me, and I want you to a wonder where your beliefs came from. Because they probably started, if you track it back far enough, from a shoe company that told some guy who was selling shoes how to sell the shoes and, um, and is, was promoting features that I'm about to show you demonstrably don't work. Yeah. Um, but more importantly, you know, if you have doubts, that's cool. Because our almost million customers, they all had doubts too, yeah. until they tried the shoe on. And then that changed everything because the experience is what sells it. So I said, so your doubt is really a market opportunity. Because right, exactly. <laughs> at a certain point, as this idea grows, we will hit a critical mass where there's enough people wearing barefoot shoes that even the doubters go, eh, may as well try it. And that's when. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And a lot of patients get to that point where they're like, I have tried every shoe yeah. in the shoe store and there is nothing left. So they might just get to that point and the next step is to try barefoot. And that's what works. That's a really, wait, I'm writing that down. Um, <laughs> if, seriously, if you've tried everything, because one thing people, people don't realize is that 
the the biggest well most people don't know this is an option because it hasn't right. been an option for exactly. the majority of the last 50 years and um uh but i never thought to really suggest if you tried everything else why wouldn't you try this right you have nothing to lose at that point <laughs> yeah and that's really interesting there's another you know i was doing a little bit of research on walking shoes because i was contributing to an article that was asking about them and i was like you know what, what are walking shoes right and so i did some research and i found this article from i think it was from 1978 maybe something around there and it was it was so funny it was basically like you know, running shoe sales were down. And so the shoe companies were trying to figure out how they could market walking as a sport because they're like, you know what, we need to, <laughs> we need to sell walking shoes. Not enough people are buying walking shoes. And so they started this kind of program to like make walking like a cool sport. And then that's how they started selling walking shoes. And I was like, wow, <laughs> this is oh really crazy. <laughs> it was, well, it was a similar thing that happened with aerobic shoes. Um, and in fact, our product designer was part of the company that really kicked that off. And they had a very simple marketing plan. They just gave away shoes to everyone teaching aerobics. Oh, wow. <laughs> and even if the people teaching didn't have to say anything, it was just everybody wanted to be that person. Yeah, the right. The, the early influencers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They were the, they were the original influencers. But, but that's incredible. It's like, we're not selling enough running shoes, so let's make walking a category. Yeah. Uh, this came up in a conversation, actually, with our product team, because walking shoes, it's a popular category. And they said, well, you know, we need to make a walking shoe. And I said... Every shoe we make is a walking every shoe. Every shoe, exactly. It took, I mean, walking is not a sport, you know? It's like you're, you walk every day, you walk everywhere. Right. Like, so why would you need a shoe for that? That doesn't make any sense. You know, I'll tell you an even better one. Do you know, um, um, it was a guy named Simon Bartold, I think when he was working mm -hmm. with Asics. Do you know what he recommended for Asics? It's no. even better than walking shoes. Different shoes for that women had to wear when they were on their period versus not on their period. Oh my God. <laughs> That's oh my God. So crazy. Yeah. Wow. Um, I did not know that one. Yeah, that one, that one uh, blew me away when I heard that. Ridiculous. It's sort of like, I mean, that's my joke is some of these companies, they want to make, give, and they really do. They want to give you a shoe for every possible yeah. thing you're doing. Like here's a shoe for when you're walking into the bathroom, right. you're leaving the bathroom because now you don't weigh as much. Oh my gosh. I mean, here's a, crazy. It, it, it really, I mean, I get it because fundamentally, you know, you don't really need much. I mean, we've got what yeah. 25 shoes behind me, but that's evolved because of special, special use case. Yeah. It's like, I need a winter boot. I need a, you know, something for work I, that looks fancy. I need, exactly. what am I looking at? Hiking boots, you know, <laughs> trail running shoe, yep. um, but we're not doing anything that's based on something ridiculous. Yeah. Like, you know, a shoe for when you're on your period or a, right. shoe for, a shoe for when it's the third Thursday of the month. Or, yeah. Or, it's oh, honestly just point. really that's about that. The soul. That yeah. Really, that's a brilliant idea. I got to write that one down. Actually. <laughs> third Thursday. Shoe. Third Thursday. <laughs> it's, the it's a TTS. very important day. <laughs> yeah, it's the TTS shoe. People are, what's that? Mean? Third Thursday. Holy crap. Because what we saw that, you know, on the third Thursday, the moon is in a different space. That's and right. so the tides are different and, you know, your waters, your body's made of mostly water. So that's just shit. I mean, this would be so easy to do. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Good. This is going to take off. <laughs> you know, actually I've got to do that as a, I'm going to do a spoof ad like that. I, you I've, totally I've should. Got to. We, thank you. We've now planned my next April fool's um, <laughs> ad is going to be something just like that. The, the shoe you have to wear when it's a full moon because the tides have changed and your, the water in your body has moved. <laughs> and so, oh, so now that you, now that you have this virtual practice, yeah. um, you know, how yeah. are people are, are people coming to you because they know you're hip to the natural movement idea or are they coming to you and discovering that? I mean, what's your experience with the, the clientele that you have now? Well, it's a combination. Um, some people are very already kind of keen to that and they've already maybe exhausted some sort of traditional podiatry uh, situations and they're looking for someone that um, you know has a different perspective. And then some people are really just coming to me and don't really know that much about it, or maybe they're just a little bit interested in it and they kind of want to learn more. So I'd say it's definitely a mix of, of types of people, which is great. Um, but the common denominator, I think, is that everybody who I see is very motivated. So it's, I'm not tending to see people who are like, you know, cause it's virtual. I'm not going to be offering people really quick fixes. I'm not going to say, Hey, I can give you a shot. I can give you this because I can't do that over, you know, through the computer. So it tends to naturally bring people that are are willing to kind of do something different and willing to to do some work on their body to make it better, which is really cool. Well, let's start with the fun thing. You're doing virtual podiatry. So are people just sitting there with their phone pointed at their feet? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so that's a little that's a little tricky. Um, basically, what I'll have people do um, before their visit is I'll have them do we'll do a couple gate videos. So we'll have them um, basically videotape themselves walking, and then we'll get some photos so we can see like some nice still pictures. And then during the session, we'll go through and do like some assessments. Um, and then so I'll kind of make people like you know move their computer around everywhere and tilt their screen down and get up on the, on their uh, you know their toes and stuff like that. But um, but yeah, it worked out okay. You know, I thought it'd be really hard. I never thought this would be possible, but um, I figured out a, a process that works pretty nicely. So yeah, it's it's cool. When um, do you have some explicit instruction you give people for something as simple as walking? Um, you know, it depends. I think some people definitely like I'll, I'll watch their gate video and like there's really obvious stuff that I can just kind of cue them into like either, you know, sort of the way that they're walking, the, the speed, maybe like the just like the cadence, things like that, that they can just easily start to use. Um, but most of the time it's more like, we'll start with exercises to kind of like wake stuff up. Cause most people come to me and they're like, you know, their feet are squished together. They can't even move their toes. Um, their hips are really stiff. So kind of like the first thing I'll do is, is really start to work on those areas, get things mobilized, like just get them moving a little bit. And then yeah. we'll start with like really more integrated movements and then kind of like retraining those, those neural, neural pathways and like getting into the gait movement so that they can actually learn what that feels like. And then, okay, now I can kind of integrate this <laughs> into my gait cycle. Um, which is, which is really cool. And the other, you know, crazy thing about podiatry that just made me think of it is that this is another barrier. I think <laughs> a little bit to the more natural movement is that, um, we're like feet only, like when you're in school, it's like, you are responsible for the feet up to like, you know, right above the ankle. Like that's like your zone. Wow. And so you just kind of miss like the whole rest of the body. <laughs> That's, um, I mean, it's amazing. And I'm going back to what you said earlier is that when you switched to a truly minimal shoe, you started feeling other things working, including your glutes, yeah. which obviously for people who don't know, um, are a major controller of your feet and vice versa. Yeah. And, um, and the fact that you would not get that information in a four-year postgraduate educational program exactly. is, I mean, the number, look, I don't know if people aren't necessarily watching this. The number of times you've said something and my chin is at the table <laughs> is high. And that's, that's one that it's never occurred to me that you wouldn't get a more, I hate to use the word holistic. I don't want to make that sound yeah. new agey, but a more comprehensive. Right. Approach. Right. Yeah. But, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's very frustrating. And I used to feel, you know, very limited by that when I was in practice, because I would think like, you know, I'm not, I don't really know, like, I'm not really looking at their hips and their pelvis and, you know, right. what kind of movement is going on there. And now, you know, now that I actually do look at that and I do help people with that, I'm like, wow, you know, I'm just thinking about the number of people that just kind of got stuck with orthotics and, you know, kind yeah. of told to go home. And maybe all they needed to do was kind of some realignment of, you know, higher up their body. They may not have even had a foot problem, right? They just kind of have a, you know, um, maybe a hip problem or more like a pelvic issue. And, you know, I think all those people are just kind of flying under the radar because they're just coming in for their foot and maybe their foot that hurts, their hip might hurt. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter where the pain is. It's always kind of coming from, from something else. Right. Yeah, um, it's uh, it, someone, uh, I don't know if this is true or not, um, but I, someone apparently asked Freud, like if he had to sum up everything he knew in a sentence as he was dying. And he, I, there was, I think two lines, one was, um, secrets make you sick. And the other was no one's upset for the reason they think they are. Yes. And, um, that was <laughs> relevant here for, for pain. It's, it's yeah, rare, that. <laughs> the thing itself, but I'm really fascinated. Um, uh, I'm, I'm imagining like in a clinical session in school, someone comes in and they've got let's say, quote, flat feet, more your quotes. Um, and then the whole conversation goes to prescribing orthotics, et cetera. And if you were there and said to someone, yeah, can you just uh, squeeze your glutes and watch what happens to your feet where they try to avert and they don't. So that builds an arch in your foot and you would watch people's heads explode. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, totally. Like there, there was just never any discussion about that, um, which is just so funny. I don't know. I always, I think even when I was a student, I just, I had a little bit of an aversion to orthotics. Like I just didn't, I never really got it. I was kind of like, ah, oh, this, this, this is a weird concept. I, it always bothered me. So I never really loved to use them. And even when I was in practice, I did prescribe them, but I, I just never, I could never fully get behind it, even though it was, you know, all we really learned. So yeah, I always felt like there was just something missing and I didn't know exactly what it was, but now I'm like, wow. And again, you know, it's like you said, all you have to do is look at the research and look at the information. There's no evidence that a custom made $1,500 orthotic is any better than a $20 Dr. Scholl's thing you get at Target. Totally. And they, they have the same outcomes and that yeah. alone should make people go, huh, something is, uh, something is awry here. But the other one that cracks me up and, and you'll love this. I saw, um, I got a free chiropractic session. 
I have, anyway, we don't need to go into my thoughts about <laughs> most chiropractors, but more importantly, um, the guy says, well, you know, uh, I was having a bunch of injuries when I got back in sprinting 15 years ago. And he says, well, you know, you need a three quarter orthotic. And I said, but when I'm sprinting, the only part of my foot that actually hits the ground is everything ahead of that orthotic. <laughs> so what's it going to do? And he said, well, you know, like when you're slowing down or walking, I said, are you out of your mind? I mean, what's it going to do? And, and right. you can see the guy just, he couldn't get, he, there's no way he could get to saying, oh yeah, um, I, I was mistaken. This actually, that won't work for you. That's funny. Yeah. That is really interesting. Cause yeah, I don't think most people really do know. Like we don't, you know, I don't really know how orthotics work. I don't think anybody really knows, you know, we kind of think we do, but no, you, I don't know you, when you read the research, it's like, well, it's actually not doing that. You know, it's not doing what, what doing something different than what people doing. think, you know, look, if somebody's getting a benefit from it, I'm not going to say no, right. but I will say if you're putting your foot in a position where it's not moving, you want to do like you did, get out of it and move your foot, use your foot as much as possible when you're not doing whatever it is you think you need that shoe right. and that orthotic for. Um, exactly. And then in fact, oh, wait, here's an, I just realized you'll like this one too. I was at the International Foot and Ankle Biomechanics Conference, and there was a guy there who will remain nameless to protect the guilty, <laughs> who was one of the top researchers about orthotics in the world. And so he put on a pair of our shoes, the Prio, in fact, behind me. And he says, you know, take a look and tell me what you notice when I'm walking with my orthotics or without. And I said, well, what'd you notice? And he goes, well, nothing. They feel really good. I said, okay, well, here's what I saw. Your right foot was pronating a little more because you're, um, you got a lot of weakness because you haven't been using your feet. But here's the kicker. A, you didn't even notice it. And B, if you actually use your feet, that would probably go away. Yeah. And so he walks up to Irene Davis, um, uh, the, the grandmother, I, uh, if I said that, if I said that to her face, she'd shoot me um, <laughs> the godmother, the anyway, most important person in yes, the most love that. <laughs> research. he came up to her and said, you know, I really like these shoes and I'm going to put my orthotic in it. And he thought he was just going to, you know, rib her and she oh. goes, That's but then after a couple of weeks, like shave it down some, and then after a couple yeah. more weeks, shave it down some more. And then after a couple more weeks, throw it away. And he was like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> like that makes sense <laughs> or, or pardon me for giving you all these but there are very few people who will understand yeah. get these stories uh with the same impact i was in the lab with dr bill sands he was the former head of biomechanics and engineering for the u.s olympic committee and i'm watching what he would do when people would come into his lab is he would have them try on every different pair of shoe that they had and put them on a high-speed giant treadmill um, and film them at 500 frames a second and what he saw is that for almost everybody, except for elite runners who mostly land on the ball of their foot or the midfoot, um, that changes what I'm about to say, their gait changed with every shoe. And when he showed me this, I just looked at him and I said, oh my God, that means orthotics are ridiculous. And he starts to laugh. He goes, why do you say that? I said, well, because they would need a different orthotic for every shoe based on their oh gait gosh, yeah. without altering gait. And he just started wow, to laugh. That's so funny. And, um, <laughs> and I said, and, you'd be, and you would need to measure the orthotic based on how they're running in that shoe or moving in that shoe. And you'd have to get a new one every time in, you know, the foam started to break down or something started changing yes. the, uh, all the geometry of the shoe. So you would need like, if you had five different pairs of shoes over the lifetime of those shoes, you would need like a hundred orthotics. There's a good business model right there. <laughs> that was exactly what I said next. I said, I said, if anyone figured that out, they'd make a fortune by selling people things they don't need. I think the Good Feet store has maybe done something like that because they have <laughs> kind of like a, <laughs> they have like a three-tier system of orthotics that they sell people. I think it's like $1,200 and they give them like three different pairs. I, I don't know why, like what you're supposed to wear them for, but it's like different activities and, and diff it's very bizarre, but yeah, they really have. You know, you can make a lot of money convincing people that they're special little snowflakes. Yeah. And, and here's something just for you. In fact, at one of those panel discussions I was on, guys from Brooks and guys from Adidas, one of the last questions, you know, what's next in footwear? And the guys from Brooks said, because everyone's a special little snowflake, they didn't say it that way, um, because everyone has a unique movement pattern, um, which is not really true, right. then we need to make uh, shoes with, with uh, special outsoles to adjust for their movement pattern. And the guys yeah. from Adidas said, well, because everyone's a special little snowflake and has a unique movement pattern, uh, we're going to make special custom made midsoles for them. And again, my question to both of them was, where's your proof that that's going to be in any way beneficial? And they had no response. 
<laughs> I mean, that's, that's crazy, but like people would totally go for that. Cause I oh, remember absolutely. people coming in and they're like, you know, this orthotic, it's, I'm looking at my foot and it's not molded here perfectly. And like, I want it to be, you know, that people want it to be like a, an actual imprint of their foot. Like that's what they, they want. And so, right. yeah, I mean, that's like, that would sell really well. <laughs> so well in fact, do well with that. Well, you know, it's kind of funny. <laughs> um, there are a number of companies that have made products that it's like, uh, here's the thing that's based on the imprint of your foot. One co- guy was yeah. trying to make sell a business. It was a sandal product where they had like a, a template, like a block of foam, um, multi-density foam. And you would, they would scan your foot and then it would use a, cu- a computer controlled cutting machine router, basically to make something that was just the shape of your foot. And then you put a strap on it. And I said, um, are they actually more comfortable or not? And he was like, well, what do you mean? It's made for your foot. I went, well, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I mean, right. you might not want something that's made your, like your foot, especially with that much foam, as you're walking, the shape of the thing is changing to not yeah. the shape of your foot. Exactly. So what do you do about that? And, you know, again, his head exploded. <laughs> A lot of explosions going on. That's... <laughs> well, you know, I think there have to be given what we've been talking about, how much people just believe these things that are patently false. Yeah. Yeah. It's so it, it's become such like a catchphrase too. like, you know, people just use these terms like supportive shoes and arch right. support and they don't, it doesn't really mean anything. It's just, it's just what people hear and they think that that's what they need. I've, I've seen so many articles where people are like, you know, what, what are the best supportive shoes and what kind of arch support should you look for? And usually I write into those articles and, you know, tell them they don't need any support and then people get really no. confused. Well, but you can, you can say that. You can also say, um, uh, by the way, I'm now selling supportive gloves. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, Didn't you know right. that your palm really needs support? You shouldn't be putting it like directly on things. <laughs> we, we have this great supportive hat that we're starting. Yeah. With, um, <laughs> that it's going to support you. It's going to support you having better thinking. Uh, or, or, I mean, so here's the, here's the risque joke. If you know where this joke goes, I'm at the age where I think I need supportive pants. <laughs> So, uh, yes. even know what that means, but it could sound right. Right if you take it that way. Support right. just sounds good. Everybody wants support. <laughs> well, everybody wants support and they want to be special. Yeah. Um, yep. We all want the exactly. thing that's made for me, despite yeah. the fact that we all fundamentally have the same kind of human body. Um, it, it, right. it really, I, I, I wonder, um, you know, there's a, here's a weird variation on that. Like when the Berlin Wall fell, when, uh, and when the Soviet Union fell as well, when these communist countries who had very few options suddenly were able to travel and saw these myriad options, they were overwhelmed to the point of, you know, paralysis practically. And, uh, and in fact, there's a thing called the paralysis or paradox of choice, you know, too many choices yeah. to do. Um, yes. So unfortunately, we are so attached to this thing of having all these choices, the freedom to get the thing that's right for us that most people don't realize that, you know, you'd be fine if it was just the one right thing or maybe totally. three or four right things. Absolutely. Yeah. That's so true. It's like, there's just so much, like people just don't even know what to do. So, yeah. So uh, one other thing, um, Oh, heading towards our time, but what else, what else have you discovered from sort of since you made this transition and have this virtual practice that you really never imagined or expected? What's a big surprise for you? Yeah. I mean, so many things I would say probably the biggest surprise is, you know, really just from from my own learning. I feel like since I've kind of started down this route, I've almost like gone through like my own, you know, fellowship or something like just kind of relearning. And so some of the things that kind of like you were saying, like everybody, everybody looks really different when you just look at one thing. And when you're really focused on maybe their feet, you might say like, yeah, everyone's really different. We have these movement patterns. But when you really break it down, kind of like you're saying, people have very, very similar patterns. And, and even when people make compensations, those compensations end up being kind of similar and you can kind of track these things. And so it does kind of make it so that, you know, you can actually fix people. <laughs> like I, I actually <laughs> never, <laughs> not fix people, but you know what I mean? I, yeah. I actually like kind of was groomed to believe that like, you actually couldn't fix these things. Like, oh, someone comes into your office and they're like, you know, let's say they have ho- like their back is fully extended and they're kind of like hobbling in. I would probably look at that person and say like, oh my gosh, like there's nothing you can do about that. Right. Like there's nothing they can fix it. So just brace it. And that's kind of like the, the real theme, I think for a lot of medical specialties. And that was the biggest eye opener for me is like, holy cow, there's actually like easy ways that we can fix a lot of these problems. And I really just didn't know that was possible. 
One of the reasons that, um, uh, or one of the things that gets us all out of, bed, out of bed in the morning here is that we hear from people all day, every day saying, oh my God, this changed my life. And yeah. I have to keep pointing out, no, 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 we just got out of the way. Yeah. So life could go back to normal. And I'm been meaning to do a little podcast rant when people say something like, um, well, you know, this minimal shoe hurt me. It's like, no, what hurt you was getting in the shoe that screwed yes. you up. And Everything it, you were for the last 50 years is <laughs> really what's allowed you to do what normal humans in other parts of the world that don't have those stupid shoes yeah. can do. You're not different than those people. Um, and they don't get it, but uh, here, here's a weird question. Given that you have this non-normal approach to your practice, how do you answer the question and talk about what you do when you're somewhere, assuming that people go out and see other human beings that they've never met before post COVID, how do you answer the, what do you do question? Yeah. So it's definitely a little bit different. I mean, I, I will typically still lead with that. I'm a podiatrist, um, but I'll usually start to, you know, talk about it a little bit more. Right. And, and I'll tell people, I'll usually tell people that I have a virtual practice because the first question people ask is, well, where do you, you know, where do you work? And that usually blows people's minds that that's even possible. So then I kind of have to go and explain to them, you know, what it is that I do. Um, and so then I'll kind of go through, you know, Hey, well, this is actually the sort of method and techniques that I use. Um, and so all of that can actually be done virtually or, or the vast majority of it. So, you know, then it kind of gets people's mind spinning and they get really confused, but it at least gets them thinking about it. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have been very receptive. I, I do like pretty much everywhere you go, if you're a podiatrist, people will ask you for shoe advice. So, you know, if you just tell everybody that asks you, you know, Hey, this is what you should try to do. Um, you know, people will, some people will listen, not everybody, but, um, you'll get some people that will be interested enough to kind of try that. And then it kind of gets people in the door. So, so yeah, people are receptive, which is cool. Yeah, I do think it really, in my mind, it really is just a matter of time and uh, enough people to have the experience yeah. that it just becomes something where people can't ignore it. And uh, to be totally candid, I'm, I literally hope that it happens in my lifetime. Um, uh, not because of any personal benefit, but because I think it's so important and I would like to see it happen. You know, somebody, yeah. I'd like to see the effect. I'd like to see what happens when that happens. Um, and somebody said to me, well, what would happen if, you know, one of the big companies ripped you off? I went, then we won. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. That's, that's so true. I love that. Yeah. I mean, one of the cool things that I, I saw happen um, is that we have a shoe store at one town over from me. That's kind of like an orthopedic shoe store that I used to send a lot of patients to. And last year it got um, purchased by a new owner. And so I went in there and they actually had they had zero shoes. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like what is going on? And so I was like, it was really cool. I was like, Oh wow. Something's going on here because you know, the whole rest of the store is like, you know, art sports shoes and stuff. Right. But just even seeing that is just like, wow, that's, that's very cool. And so that, that just gets people interested just seeing uh, stuff. Agreed. I mean, you know, there, we, we had some people send us pictures from REI stores where there's just our, our sandals and our shoes are just taking up a giant chunk of wall and, um, and they're selling not because we're pushing it and not even because they're pushing pushing it, frankly, because yeah. a lot of their, their people on the, the footwear floor don't really know what to do about our shoes yet, but people just try them on and go, oh my God, and that's what's making it work. And I'm just hoping that we can do more just to make more of that happen, just to give more people the experience. Because again, that's the, that's the number one thing you can't, you, you can believe whatever you believe, but then if you have an experience that argues with that, it's really hard to keep that belief yeah. going. Yeah, so, absolutely. Well, this has been a total, total pleasure. Um, if people want to get in touch with you and find out more about what you're doing or find out how you might be able to help them, will you please tell them how to do that? Yes, absolutely. So you can find me on my website, which is Dr. Ark. So D-O-C-T-O-R-A-R-K.com. And then on Instagram, uh, Dr. Ark.dpn. Beautiful. Um, I really look forward to people taking advantage of that. And I want you to tell me what happens when they do. And Absolutely. We'll some more stories and, um, you know, and, and just, I, I'm, I'm back to the whole idea of sort of that critical mass thing. I think part of that critical mass is people who have traditional medical training starting to wake yeah. up as well. And at some point I'm going to put this bug in your head, although I imagine it's already been there. You have got to find a way to be lecturing at podiatry schools. I know. Yeah. I think that'd be really cool. So that's definitely a goal that I have, It would be, especially since there's only that one lecture, right? I think it would be kind of easy to speak in maybe like a half hour lecture after that, at least just, just you know, a 20 second, something, give me like an, yeah, yeah, just, you know, let's just open the door a little bit and see what happens. Um, I, I have my fingers crossed. So once again, thank you. And for everybody else, um, thank who's you so listening, much. Oh, again, 
pleasure. Um, so by the way, a r- quick reminder, if you want to find out more other than finding Alyssa, then you can uh, find out more about uh, the other episodes we've done in the Movement Movement podcast. And there are a bunch of them. So go to www.jointhemovementmovement.com and you'll find all of those. And if you have any questions or some suggestions, people you think should be on the show, uh, people who might argue with me and think I have my head completely my butt because I have a case of cranial rectal reorientation syndrome, happy to have that conversation. It'd be very entertaining. Uh, you can send me an email. I'm at move, M-O-V-E, at jointhemovementmovement.com. And until then, uh, most importantly, just go out, have some fun, and live life feet first.